I'm EOC Hall of Famer Forrest Griffin, and I'm about to give an interview to the Hannibal TV. Dot com, motherfucker. So I'll start off by asking you what your uh, childhood was like. Um, man, you know, my childhood was 100% uh, ordinary. Yeah, I had an awesome mom. Guess that's about it, man. It's pretty basic. I'm the, I'm the only one of the few guys that really liked their stepdad because when, when my mom married uh, my stepdad Byron, we like moved into a nice house in the suburbs. It was like nice. So most people don't like their stepdads. I love mine. What sports did you play when you were a kid? Uh, football, basketball, soccer, track. Uh, I only took football and basketball serious though. Did you do any martial arts? No, I got in fights, but I never did martial arts. And I beat up a couple of people that did martial arts, so I assumed that martial arts were bullshit. You know, you see a fat guy in pajamas, you know, doing this, and I was like, what the fuck? Just to speak on that for a second, what do you think of like people that hold belts in such high esteem? Because I've, I find a lot of times, maybe when they're further into the degrees of black belt, but like, some of your first and second degree black belts aren't really that good as far as anime may inspire you. I mean, there's no correlation. Yeah. Depends on what you do, you know? Like, you've got a, a, a wrestling background. You, you, I mean, you know, if you have basic submission defense knowledge, if you get to any of those guys, you, you destroy them, right? You know, size and strength matter, unfortunately. That's where there's weight crisis, so. So you never like had any goals of like being a specific belt or anything? No, once I got into it, I started rolling with black belts and they would fuck me up. So I thought, I'm gonna be a black belt. <laughs> so you said you were- I, I, So I found in jujitsu that the belt system seemed to be pretty valid. But like when I rolled with brown belts and black belts, I was like, going for my life all of a sudden, you know, these, and a lot of times, you know, I, I was a little bigger, you know, as strong or stronger than a lot of guys, and I usually had pretty good cardio, and I was like, man, these guys have technique, so, you know, I got a 190 pound guy that's not in physically as good a shape I am as I am, but he can hold his own with me because it's that good of technique. There might be something to this belt system. Now, you said you uh, were in a couple of fights growing up, maybe more than a couple. Was that you fighting in sports or sticking up for people? Or no, yeah, I, I was just, yeah, I was just a big kid early. And I didn't have a ton of fear of fighting if it started right away. I remember one situation where I had to fight this kid at like three o'clock and I was literally like falling apart like all day and I, I didn't even, I, he just like sort of slapped me around. I don't think I even ever hit him. Maybe I did finally, but but yeah. But usually like some would happen and, and you know, as soon as we just start fighting. And then, um, you know, I never, nothing bad ever happened, so. I did get knocked out cold when I was 13, though. Was that by a pine shirt? Man, that's a great story, actually. I'll go ahead and tell it. My friends were filling grocery carts with bricks, paving bricks and rolling them down a hill into a, a Winn-Dixie or a Piggly Wiggly parking lot and crashed them into cars. And this is true. I came over and told them, I was like, man, you guys, you shouldn't do that. So, you know, and I was like telling them not to do it. And as I'm telling them not to do this, this guy drives up and this like 16, 17 year old kid drives up, gets out of his car and uh, you know, they all run off and I just stand there because I wouldn't do anything and he starts accusing me of it and I basically tell him to fuck off or something. It's like, well, who are they? And I was like, I don't know, why don't you go find them, you know, or something. And I was talking shit with my hands in my pockets. Jams, I don't know if you remember jams with the pot. Like, yeah. I couldn't, so the guy punched me in the face, I couldn't get my hands out of my pockets and uh, the back of my head hit a curb. And I remember going to the hospital um, Cause I was like all loopy and, and whatever, and the doctors tell my mom that I was bullshitting, it, that I was faking this this concussion or head injury. This is in the 80s, man, yeah. because uh, I didn't want to get in trouble. 
and then I'd probably been actually rolling the things. But, but I lost like a good two or three hours. Story gets better. My friend that was rolling the stuff down, like a friend that was doing the, the, the dirt, his dad was Big Tim, and he's a badass. And uh, he goes over to that guy's trailer to the dad who, you know, the kid lived at home. And he, uh, he told the kid's dad, he said, look, someone's getting an ass whooped. You can come out here, I'm gonna whip your ass. It was like at the trail park, everybody knew. It was like, I'm gonna whip your ass, or you can send your son out here. His, uh, his ass whooped. So he sent his son out. The big tip beat up that 17 year old kid. Uh, that's pretty funny. That's my first concussion. And I'm sure you've had many since. So the first time I was knocked out, I guess, yeah. When did you first uh, see MMA on TV? Man, you know, so I saw MMA, I want to say 95 in shop class. We locked our teacher out and I'd run to the UFC because I'd heard that they were like, whatever. And I thought it was stupid. It was like fucking dudes with like mullets and just talking crazy shit. And, and a fat guy, it was actually Dan Severn, a fat guy in a bathing suit. And I'm like, why does he get a European bathing suit on? I didn't get it, I never watched pro wrestling. And I was like, it looks like an out of shape pro wrestler. And who's that little Mexican dude in pajamas? What's going on there? And like, I just didn't get it. You know, and then like, uh, Gracie wins. And he, like, we're in our class talking. We don't even know what's happened. So I was like, that's dumb. And then, 1999, I, uh, just, I saw it again. It was Randy Couture, Vitor Belfort. And I said, shit, man, that is, that's a sport. And that's right around the same time I realized I was not going to play college football, that I wasn't good enough. And, uh, you know, I literally saw Adam and Roy Singer, the Singer Brothers, the hardcore gym, and now Straight Blast Gym of Athens, Georgia, like fighting each other in like a room. And I was like, I walked by at the gym and I was like, man, that looks fun. I want to do that. So then I, you know, literally just saw it on TV and was like, oh, that looks cool. Let me try that. And I, you know, I wasn't horrible at it, so it's so crazy, you know, we would go to seminars and we'd pay money and fly around the country to go to seminars and to learn moves because there was no YouTube, there was no internet, there were very few fights, so if you wanted that knowledge, and then I remember having like VHS cassettes we would pass around of all the fights and then we would see a move in a fight and try and do it, you know, uh, it was so... You know, and that, that you think about the, the speed of the sport, the speed of the development of the sport has changed because there's so many fights and there's so much information. Like I was telling you, I was just watching, you know, the Fedor Mir fight on Twitter this morning. No, they got to get a better piracy team. Yeah, I was reading, I was uh, reading your book, the story about the tough man competition you did with the. Uh, steel chain as the third rope. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy, poor guy broke his leg. Broke the guy's leg on a boxing match, yeah. So that was like your introduction to professional Well, well I, was, I was training jiu-jitsu at the time a little bit, and I was kind of like halfway. Yeah, you know, that actually, no, I think that was before I ever trained. But I was literally like the tough guy, so they were like, oh, you should do that. And I thought it'd be fun. I, you know, I just started training, like earlier. Uh, yeah, you know, it was kind of fun. Um, yeah, I, so I was, I was at like Gypstick doing my driver's educa uh, stuff for the police academy at the same time. And so I would like get done, drive four hours, box, drive back after. And that's, I mean, people, if you want to fight, tell me about how you want to fight when you you know, have your final exam for the driving part of the police academy the next day, which like, I kinda wanna do this fight. And then the second night I lost, I didn't have to drive back. But I got done, drove straight, basically got to the arena. Uh, this is when Surge was a thing. Yeah. Drank a bunch of Surge. Yeah. Energy type drink, like soda, cause I never drank sugar anyway, and somebody told me that, that would help me. So you were actually a cop, I guess, for a couple of years there after college? Yeah, yeah. Well, in college. I was in college for like six and a half. When you, when you say in college, I mean, I was just taking like a class or two a semester. Oh, okay. Lots of people go to school for six and a half years. Yeah. 
Well, I never went to college, so you do a lot better than you. <laughs> so, uh, how did you ha end up having your first actual professional MMA fight? You know, Adam Roy Singer, new new guy that was having fights. You know, and they're not on, they're not really listed anywhere, but it's funny. So you had to win two fights, and then you got paid. So I made like a couple hundred bucks, and then I, you know, was in two tournaments, and I fought. Uh, Fought guys in each of those tournaments. There were guys that ended up being in the UFC later. So I won both of those and I was just ready. You know, so I had about seven, eight minutes of total fight time under my belt when I fought Dan Sever. <laughs> what did you think of those tournament format fights where you're fighting multiple times every night? Um, I mean, at the time, I didn't know any better. It seemed, seemed like the thing to do, right? Now you're like, man, how can you do that? But um, I was 21 or 22, 21 maybe, 22. That's the way you fight. You just like, you're kind of, you know, like I remember I won both those fights in a couple of minutes or I lost in a couple of minutes. But that's kind of the way you fight for a tournament. So, you know, it wasn't instinctive, it was just pure luck. And you mentioned in your school fight when you knew the time and you had to kind of deal with yeah. build up to the fight, it was hard. Did you find that in your first MMA fights? I did, a little bit, yeah. But I kind of knew that once I got in there and started going, that it'd be good. The cool thing about all those fights, like even the fight with Severin, is I was working, you know, full-time as a police officer. I was trying to take a class in college. I was training. I didn't really have enough time to think too much. You know, there was no time to sit around. Like, I think I worked the night before I fought him. Yeah. <laughs> and there's know? no pressure, like. Yeah, there's no pressure. There was nothing, you know? Uh, it was really fun. Even losing was fun. I was like, you know, I went out after him. It was like, I was laughing. Were you happy when you found out you were gonna get that fight against Severn because he was the big guest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was really cool. Uh, how, how did he, uh, treat you because he's known for like telling jokes in there sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I talked more than he did. Oh yeah? What, what, what was the discussion? I kind of started trying to make fun of him. I was just trying to get him to do something and I wasn't like, I was too much of a pussy to like open up my guard and actually like try and get up and give him my back. So I just like laid in the guard and held him. And I was like, man, he, he, you know, you look, you look fatter in person. You look slimmer on TV. It was like, man, you know, you you look like uh, an overweight. Uh, what's the name? Tom Selleck. Fat, fat, fat Freddie Mercury. I didn't, I didn't notice. I didn't think of that at the time. Uh, now, what do you think of his career? Because he was pretty interesting. He just took every fight that was offered to him and see him. He, he had something. I think like a, over 120 fights. Yeah, I mean, he, he fought a kid named Jason Weezer act and lost to him. You know, it's basically a guy bigger than him got on top of him. And it was like, oh shit, you know, a really good high school wrestler from where I'm at. And so I think he was actually coming off a loss maybe when I fought him. Um, but just, just crazy. Just, I mean, you know, the, I don't know what he's done right, but he's done it right. I mean, look, he, he's fine today. Yeah, he has no injuries. Dude, he moves around better than, than most guys in, in their 30s. Yeah. You know, he's happy, he's he's completely lucid. There, there's no telling, you know. Uh, it's just so crazy. Like, he just appears fine, and he had all those fights, and he, you know, he's doing something right. And you ended up defeating Jeff Munson, I think, in your next fight. What was that? Was that my next fight? I mean, unless you can tell me something different, that's what I was reading off your bio. But yeah, it couldn't be. I don't know. <laughs> Seems like, I don't know, and that's when, that's, that's when you would like get a fight and it would fall through and you got a fight and then the promotion, you know, would get canceled and yeah. I was another one, man, you know, just like a, I had like a two or three hour drive and I just couldn't fucking wake up for that fight. So it's only two and a half hours, but, but like I hit, uh, I hit Atlanta like right during peak traffic time, and I was like, "Fuck," you know, because it's driving from Athens to Atlanta. Should only been two hours, but it's taking like three. And, you know, I was just fucking exhausted from getting out of the car, and I just remember jumping rope for like an hour and being like, "Fuck, I can't break the sweat. I can't wake up." 
And then another one, you know, it's like, fuck was I so skinny for? <laughs> what was I doing? You just stay kid. I guess you're young, you had good metabolism back then. Hey, but you ended up beating him, I guess. Yeah, and they just made up uh, an overtime round so I could win. <laughs> they were just like, eh, overtime. And you fought uh, Shail Sonnen pretty soon after that. Uh, he's gone on to become a big star. Do you have any memories about that fight? No, he was a cool kid at the time. You know, he was, uh, that was, uh, I always liked the Shail story, you know. He was a guy, he was just a grinding wrestler, you know. Kind of a yuppie back then, just, you know. Um, you know, real nice guy, polite. You, you would, to see that, what was that, 2003 or four, maybe, three? To see that guy, you never thought he could have turned into Chiasan. But he's like, you know what? I gotta sell it a little bit, you know? Yeah. Like, kind of a born fighting style, but he made, he made everything so exciting, you know? And he still is. Yeah. Did you see his fight against uh, Jackson or something? No, I didn't. And what do you think about the people? I know you look different now, but there were some people that used to say you looked similar to Shino. I'm, I mean, I guess goofy white boys kind of look alike, but I don't think there's that much of a resemblance. I thought, if anything, when I was younger, I looked like Rich Franklin. Rich, yeah, I see that too. Oh. Uh, now, I, now I look like Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. How did you hear about uh, The Ultimate Fighter? That's a great story. I didn't. Frank Bishop called me up. I'd given up. I was actually I was scheduled to take a fight at heavyweight in at Atlanta, I think, for like 500 bucks that November. And so I was kind of training for that. But my best grappling partners were like a buck 65, buck 70. Um, you know, so. You know, and then I would just go to the, I didn't have any Muay Thai there, but then I would go to like the boxing gym, which is a pretty serious boxing gym, especially when you're a cop and they don't really love you for that. But, uh, so I was just doing that and I was just working full time and I was trying to study for the GRE, maybe go back and get a master's so I could advance a little, maybe get like a federal law enforcement job. And, you know, I had life going on, you know, I had, to, I think I had a girlfriend at the time and, uh, you know, I was like 24, and then all of a sudden, Frank calls me up. He's like, "Hey, you know, you want to? We got this opportunity, and then it was 17 days. You had to give 21 days notice at the department I was at to be like eligible for rehire, and then you had to work there for over a year to take a leave of absence. And I worked there for like 11 months and 12 days, and I was like, man, fuck everything. I missed it by four days. I missed it by 20 days. You know." And so I was very excited. I had to give up everything if I wanted to go. Yeah. So I did. I put everything in storage, and then um, I never did pay the storage for it. So I always looked for my stuff in storage wars. So how did uh, Dana know about you? Like, I don't think he did. Uh, so I talked to, I talked to Joe Silva. I can't bump that table. I talked to Joe Silva like a year before, over a year before. And, you know, Joe Silva, it's funny, I was so happy to talk to Joe Silva. And he's basically like, don't lose, and we can use you in the UFC in February. But that November, I broke my arm. And uh, I was like, fuck this, I'm done. You, you know, uninsured, break your arm. I think I needed a plate, but I couldn't get the surgery, because they won't do surgery for free. They'll cast you as many times as they want, but I, you know, elephant non-union, fracture, break, whatever. And, and uh, so I was just like, I was done. But I was still like, Gonna maybe take a little fight on a local level if I could work it around work, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I was like, hey, do you want to do this? I was like 235 pounds. I was like, ah, uh, shit. <laughs> Again, you know, when I was fighting heavyweight, I was always getting too skinny, and then the shows at 205, and you're all huge. That was the last minute replacement, I think, because Jason McDonald failed the test for marijuana. Okay. Jason the athlete McDonald. So I think he was gonna be on the show. So there, I guess there was some type of money involved with the show too. It wasn't just you were paid for your fights. Were you paid like a fee, a weekly fee? Yeah, it was like six hundred bucks a week. It's like extra SAG money, you know. It's not. There it wasn't. 
I mean, it wasn't shit. It was less than I was making working. And I was making a whopping 26000 a year working, so it yeah. wasn't a lot of money. Did they pay for your food and everything? Who? Uh, UFC, like, for your food and everything. Yeah, yeah, you're living in the house, so they pay for everything. Because you're in the house on the show, so. I mean, it's 61 days of freeness. Were you surprised that they were doing like all those other challenges, not just fighting challenges? So I'd never seen a reality show before. So I didn't know. I didn't even know it was going to be there was. I thought I didn't think there was going to be a fight until week eight. I thought the people that got picked, you know, that the, I only thought there was going to be one fight at 85 and one fight at 205 at the end. Right. So I thought I had time to lose 20. So how did you do it? No, I mean, I just, I stayed real, you know, real strict, some of the best, you know, dieting I've ever done, actually. Uh, you know, I, I joked later when I saw myself, like, the last fight in the house, I was like on the extreme uh, muscle loss diet, like the extreme muscle, muscle reduction workout plan. So just, just overtraining, grinding, not eating, but again, B25 or 26, that's, that's the key. Who is the uh, hardest cast member to deal with in the house, living there, seeing those guys literally all the time? Man, I don't know. I feel like I got along with everybody pretty well, you know? I, I didn't really have any problems. I mean, leaving was definitely the biggest, but we seemed to always get along. What was with him kicking down your, your door? Well, that was Koscheck's room. That's where Koscheck slept. We were in the same room. So he thought Koscheck would be in there, but Koscheck was still away. Yeah, that was hilarious. It's like, there's no locks on any door. So I was like, nah, the door's open. And I was really like, you know, passed out, like asleep, out, you know. That woke me right up though. And Bonner was telling us yesterday that uh, you guys were actually pretty good friends in the house. Yeah, yeah, we got along easy. I actually, I don't know if he told you, but he snuck out after he won his fight. He snuck out of the house. And I try, I like gave him some money because I randomly had some money in my bag to go, you know, he went and bought some like Mad Dog 2020 like a mile away or something. And yeah, I like tried to cover for him and act like he wasn't sneaking out of the house. Like, oh, he's just in the shower, yeah. No, I mean, I was just real, I've never needed to hate someone to fight them or not like them, you know. Um, you know, fear and, you know, self, uh, self-love is all the hate you need, you know. Yeah, he was saying that he was a little hesitant to hit you at first, but then you came out really hard and then he's like, oh God, I gotta oh, defend yeah. myself here. All right, well, see, that's funny you say that, because I, th I thought the other way. Like, if you watch that fight back, I'm just sitting there like, okay, cool. And he's like, you know, I was like, oh, okay, all right. Got the mean face going. Is it less nerve wracking, like when you're facing your friend because you know him pretty well, so there's not really that intimidation factor? So, you gotta break down what, what you know, th there's fear, there's distress, you stress. Um, so it's performance anxiety at the end. Uh, you can be a little afraid or intimidated because the person you're fighting is good or mean or whatever, but I mean, that's more based on their skill set. But you, I mean, I, no, not really. Either way, it's, I mean, you're looking at their skill set compared to yours and you're saying, ooh, that's a tough matchup for me. Um, you know, and it, it's just, you know, it's pure logic, right? Were you going into that fight pretty confident that uh, you were going to take it? No, I was going in unconcerned about the results, really. Like, I'm, so I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try my best. I've trained pretty hard for this. I know I'm not going to quit. So the outcome is, you know, I, I've done everything I can to get the outcome I want. There's no point in worrying about anything else. And what do you say to the people that uh, say I was the greatest fight of all time? I think UFC even ranked it the greatest fight of all time. No, it wasn't the greatest fight of all time at all. 
Um, it's a pretty good fight, but it was definitely one of the most important fights, right? So it was just the scope of the situation, the gravity of the situation, you know, the, the fact that the deal for the second season got done right after that fight. Like, as the main event, Ken Shamrock and Rich Franklin were fighting, you know, the main event, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, it was just important for TV. And what were your what was your reaction when you won, knowing that you're now going to have this six for your contract? Well, I was really excited because I knew that my job, my sole job, was now to be as good as I could at MMA. And before, I felt like I was always kind of cheating myself because I'd been in school and then have a job, a job, a job, or you know, for a while I had to do you know odds and ends to pay for life so I could afford to fight, you know. Of course, uh, you got pretty famous from that show. Uh, did you notice that right away after people recognizing you on the street? Oh yeah, yeah, right away. And it's funny, you know. I think the thing Steph and I both did really well is we're not, we're very, you know, common, right? So very, you know, not intimidating. Very much like the goofy kid next door. Um, so people were always like, "Hey, man," you know. It's kind of almost the, the what I called the Jeremy Horn effect, where people are like, well, that guy's not that tough or anything. I could do that if he could do that, you know. So people were always like, yeah, I started fighting because I saw you and you didn't appear to be that good, so I figured I could do it. I was like, oh, thanks, thanks. And what are your thoughts on Ken Shamrock? I, I actually just saw him. We shot that, uh, that uh, laid back Luke and Steve Aoki video here. He was just here. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, seems like a nice guy. I've uh, I've talked to him at length. So I was in a fight. I was cornering somebody in a small time fight. He was the main event, and I'm talking to him for quite a while. He's really nice to me. You know what? Something else I'll say is, I did radio interviews with him the week of the fight, the week I fought Stefan, and he was real nice to me. You know, and that meant a lot because I knew who he was. He didn't know who the fuck I was. And he was real nice. You know, we're sitting in the car, and he's like, "Well, you're bigger than me. I'll let you sit up front." So. What do you say to the people that I know for a fact it wasn't fixed or anything, but that fight leading up Kimbo Slice, all the all those rumors that like he dropped that fight on purpose? So. Oh well, I mean, I just say. Man, that's a 50-year-old chin, bro. Yeah. You know, I mean, those people never been put out. They've never been put on Queer Street, and then, you know, they never, they never tried to, you know, the deer legs. So, I don't know. I mean, I've been, I've been clipped behind the ear before. I know, even though if it doesn't look dramatic, you're, you're off. Even if it's just for 10 or 15 seconds, your, your body's not listening to you. Speaking of which, uh, if you, for you personally, if you're going to knock someone out, where do you find, uh, in your experience, the best place to hit is? I actually, like the back of the neck or right behind the ear. Yeah, and I, you know, kind of, I think Connor tries to hit people here. It's a tender spot, maybe. Definitely not the front or the, you know. I don't mind getting hit in the face. That's pretty cool. You bleed and it gives you cool scars and it's kind of fun. Looks dramatic, you know, rocky like, but you start getting clipped around here, or even in the jaw. Or, you know, if you can land a kick and whip somebody's head, you know, that spine can't keep up with the brain for a second and it kind of sets a reset. And Kimbo Slice was in UFC for a while. Did you have much interaction with him? Yeah, yeah. He actually came out and trained. That's funny, man. So, yeah. Uh, who's the Canadian coach that passed away? Steve Tompkins yeah. was training him at Couture with Randy and us, and I worked out with Kimber for a bit. He he good hands actually. It's unfortunate, I guess, that he passed away. Have you seen his son in that fight at all? I have not. Where's the son fight? All over the place. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know if he signed to any one particular company. Yeah. He's done all right. Baby slices is what he's calling himself here. Yeah. Good for him. And your first Tito Ortiz fight, uh, what are your memories of that? Oh man, I just, you know, just uh, just frustration, 
not really doing shit, shutting down. He actually caught me with a nice punch because I was standing so upright. And then I was like, oh, okay, we're boxing here. And then the second I went up to, to kind of throw back, he was a beautiful double leg. And I'm, I just, you know, yeah. I don't know, you're looking back, you say four, it's like there's a thousand things you could have done to get up, but at the time, man, he felt strong, and every time I'd do anything, he would land on a nice elbow, so, you know, it was a rough one. Bonner was telling us that he really didn't like Ortiz personally. Did you have anything you had personally against him? I, I, I don't, uh, no, I actually saw him, more, you know, more friendly to not. We're never gonna get lunch together. Uh, his his uh, Amber Miller and my wife are still kind of friends. We, all, me and my wife used to live actually briefly with her. Okay. Yeah. So she was always a, a good uh, landlord, tenant, whatever. And you know, I don't know. I'm, I I actually ended up bumping into Tito in the elevator after that fight, and he was like really nice, and I was like. Oh, wow, you were a real dick before too. I guess I guess you're just playing again. <laughs> you're selling fights, <laughs> you know. Now uh, Stefan was telling us he really didn't want to have the rematch with you because he was uh, injured. I guess he tried to get out of it. And they sent him a check. Yeah. So he he got cut. So yeah, he got cut like right before that fight. We took that fight on five weeks, which isn't a ton of time. And then I was told he was pulling out and I was having trouble with weight. So I was like, oh shit, can I fight a heavyweight just once? And they were like, no. And I was like, okay, shit. Sure. And uh, yeah, so, and then I remember like I, this fight better happen because I was, uh, I had already committed to do like a USO tour. And um, I had to cancel like literally the day before I was supposed to go because I, you know, found out that that fight was a possibility. So I, I didn't understand it at the time, but now that I work here, I get it. Putting fights together is no easy business. If you want to be a professional fighter and you want good opportunities, stay ready. Stay ready, you know, six weeks is all you're going to get anymore. There's 41 events, people are getting hurt, people are falling out, people don't want to take fights. Get healthy, stay healthy, train, but don't overtrain, and keep your weight right, you know? Keep keep within striking distance. and. It's the best way for a second tier or even third tier guy to make that jump. Because um, at the end of the day, you have to work. You have to actually fight somebody, you know? And then you get that first tier guy, you get a shot at them. And maybe they wreck you, but people aren't going to hold it against you if you take a fight against somebody good on short notice. If anything, it's more stressful for that named guy, that, you know, top 10 guy, and have to, oh shit, I got to fight this guy I've never heard of. Fuck, you know? Yeah. And if he loses, it's a bigger deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. I mean, he, he's put himself out of, out of you know, uh, out of the money fights, basically. And uh, what did you think about your Keith Jardine fight? Man, you know, that was one uh, did most everything right for that. It was a real disciplined camp. May have overdone it. I did a 17-week camp for that. Because I actually thought I was going to fight November 30th. There was a card November 30th. And they're like, no, you're going to fight December 26th. I was like, or 7th, 8th, whatever. So I, I, I was like, well, cool, man. I got a great thing going. And, I, you know, just you can't, you can't train hard for 17 weeks straight. You know? You wear yourself out. And you had a weird reaction at the end of that fight. Was that just you were in a bit of shock or something? What do you mean? Apparently, I guess you left the cage or something before. Yeah, I've never understood. I've never understood. They're not going to interview you. The fight's over. Just fucking get out of there. I, I I would never again. Looking back, if I lost the fight and I knew I lost, like stop, I'm not going to the decision. Yeah, I just leave. You know. So there's no, I mean, there's no reason to be in there. It's just like, you know, kind of sitting there to be embarrassed more. I don't, I don't get it. And I guess you had a, a staph infection after that that caused you to pull out of a fight. 
Man, I've had a lot of staff. So I didn't know staff was like a thing, you know, because you get staff, but MRSA is a thing. So that's why we make sure the mats are clean here. What, for those that don't know, because I've been researching it lately and it's pretty serious, uh, those type of infections. So yeah, there's staff is everywhere, right? So staff is in every hospital everywhere, staff, staff, staff. Um, but it's your reaction to it and it's whether or not it's that MRSA and that resistant staff. So when I had staff, I ended up being on antibiotics for five weeks straight, which will also drain the shit out of you. So I didn't, you know, like IV antibiotics, shot in the ass, not just the pill. So if you like really scrub yourself after, will that help? Like if yeah. every time you fight or train? Yeah, yeah, it, it will. And then the other thing, what, what I, the mistake I made is I used to like throw a little bleach in the bathtub Okay. and wipe myself down with bleach. Yeah. yeah, you destroy your body. You destroy the top layer of skin. So you actually make yourself more susceptible to those skin-borne illnesses. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> I never heard of that. Yeah, so I would just like throw a little bleach on myself. Yeah. You know, it was like more for Michael Jackson, right? No, it didn't. I don't think it really did. And you fought uh Anders did so well after that one fight of the next. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was nice of him to make that fight at night. Fight of the night because Anderson was coming off two boring fights. So, yeah, that's a thing. What do you think of him as a fighter? <sighs> it's funny. You look back and it seems like there's there's an easy easy-ish game plan to beat him. You know, he, he can be beaten. Um, yeah, you know, just like at that time, though, know, people don't realize that at that time, it was like, he was the god. Yeah, and just like, nobody would really shown the game plan on how to beat him. You know, that, once you get exposed, even at that level, it's like, okay, there, there's an opportunity to beat him here. Do you think he's done with fighting now? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I think maybe that's all he knows. I have no idea. And what are your thoughts on your second fight with uh, Ortiz and like, how did you prepare differently for that one? Well, that was a great story. I was on my honeymoon. We're up in, uh, I forget where, but we're up in no cell phone. We drive down and bam, 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 Dan White starts ringing. And I had like uh, some garbage like in my hand as I'm filling my gas up talking to Dan. And uh, I turned that fight down in the beginning. And we were supposed to like, we were about to drive to Yosemite. And I was just like, I threw, threw my little donut type Danish in the trash. And I got in the car and I drove back to Vegas. So I cheated out of the second half of my honeymoon for that. So I guess did that play a role in it? Like you better win this time if it's costing you half of your honeymoon? No, no, I mean, it was just a fun little matchup. It was a good little fight, you know? I thought, he, I thought he fought pretty well in that one, you know? I thought I was in a better place than I was. And you fought Rich Franklin after that. Uh, he was really known for his conditioning. Uh, did you train your conditioning more than usual? No, I was coming off a pretty bad injury after I fought him, and I was huge. And that's the only third round I've ever lost in a fight. Except for, like, you know, quick shot where I got knocked out but <laughs> in the third round but yeah no uh, you know he, I just got that take down early because it'd been over a year since I fought I was in a bad place coming off you know injury and injury that required surgery and was, you know I got huge well fighting's hard man I don't see how you guys don't get hurt anymore. yeah it's funny I was, I was like you know, you're watching like pro wrestling and you're like, that'd be fun. And you're like, how the fuck, man? That's, my well, shoulders hurt just from looking at that shit. The difference I think is in wrestling, you can still wrestle if you're injured. Yeah. Like, you can work around it. Or yeah, yeah. Fighting, like you can end your career if you go into a fight with an injury. Hmm, yeah. Potentially, but yeah, I mean, just the grind of wrestling seems ridiculous. Oh yeah, the, tra the travel alone. Well, being you. your size and trying to move and, you know, fly coach three different times a week to perf perform. And 
you know. Yeah. Well, in retrospect, if actually uh, MMA had been more popular, probably when I was younger, and more of a viable option, that makes Especially sense. with wrestling, now. Yeah. But that was like you, like, but I guess you really love martial arts, but there wasn't much money in it. Really? Yeah, yeah, I was never like martial arts. I just like fighting. Well, I like fighting too, but unfortunately, most of the fights I've been in, I didn't get any money for. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been in a couple of fights where it ended up costing me money too. So, so for your uh, first and second Shogun fights, uh, what are your memories of, of those? Of course, your second, your, your wife was in labor. Uh, no, I mean you know. Uh, first one was obviously awesome, second one sucked. Yeah. You know, and that, that second one for me and him, I think we're both coming off wins and it was like, uh, it, it was that kind of, for us, it was a road back to a title shot for one of us, you know? Yeah. Not me. What's that like finding out that your kid's about to be bored and now you gotta go? So it's not that, I mean, it's a de-stressor, you know? Um, Cause that was for me, that was like, the last time I really thought like being a champion again was a viable option or getting to that fight or you know becoming the elite and um, you know after that loss I, I, I would you know on an intellectual level wouldn't have thought that but you have a kid man and it's just you know you, you, you don't care about anything you have that kid and you get that that child's health is all that really matters. So I was just so overcome with love for my wife and daughter that I just didn't give a shit. So I would, I would, every time you lose a fight, just immediately have a kid. It's very endorphin. Yeah, you know, I didn't sleep for like a week, you know, so we had all this stuff going on, but I was still fired up, full of endorphins, so. And your third Ortiz fight, uh, which was another victory for you, uh, any memories of that? Uh, no, nah, that was that was, that was a fun one. You know, it was a good fight. I wish we had had a little more. Definitely frustrating for me, because uh, you know, so man, he's gonna he's gonna start to fade with two minutes left, and sure enough, started to fade every round. Two minutes left, minute, two minutes left, and then uh, I was just being a wimp. I I he was tired. He was a little sitting on the fence. And I took in my mind what was about 10 seconds to walk around, but you know, just to kind of move out, just to kind of not really do anything. I was like, I still have got a minute left to work. And uh, you know, next thing I know, it's, you're out of time, there's 30 seconds left. And you know, he started going harder, and I was like, oh shit, you know? Because I, I, had, I had an opportunity, you know? And uh, you know, it, it's like when you don't leave it all in the octagon. And you ended up tearing your MCL shortly after that. How did that injury? ACL, MCL, meniscus. Yeah. Just in training, or yeah, yeah. Three weeks out from the fight with Phil Davis, and then I retore it eight months later. Eight months later, I tore the MCL completely off the bone playing soccer with some five-year-olds trying to impress my three-year-old daughter at the time. That's how it seems to happen. Always. Uh, how was that? Man? And you know what's funny is I. I was like, immediately when it hurt my knee, I was like, fuck it, I'm done. And then as I was doing the rehab, I was actually doing rehab with some high school kids. And, uh, you know, I'm feeling the foot ladder, and, you know, seven months, eight months, feeling pretty good. And then, you know, I was like, fuck, man, I'm in good shape again. I'm pretty healthy, you know. I, I definitely got a fight or two. I mean, especially, you know, for what, what guys are getting today. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny, you know. People like, uh, Remember when people used to be like, you fight Mike Tyson for a million bucks? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, but I'd definitely fight Fredo for 300,000. Yeah, especially now. <laughs> I'd give it a shot. <laughs> Fuck it. Now, you went into the Rampage Jackson, Jackson fight as an underdog, and uh, you ended up pulling off fight of the night, and you won, uh, you, you won the lightweight title as well. Um, how important was winning a title to you in the, in the victory of the Rampage? I mean, it's the highlight of my career. It's the most impressive thing I ever did, so. Well, that's very important. Outside of my daughter, it's the biggest thing ever happened to me, right? And he was at his peak there, obviously, too. Yeah, no, he was, he was really, he was really, you know, he was coming off that knockout, or he'd knock Chuck out, he knocked everybody out, so. 
What do you think about him uh, getting into acting now and doing pretty decent? In that? Yeah, no, he 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 has. He's done well. Uh, Jardine's done well. A bunch of those guys that that beat me up have done well at acting. So that's you know, let that be a lesson. <laughs> Randy Couture is doing pretty good. He beat me up in the gym for years. So I'm like, good luck. Memories of uh, fighting with Sean Evans. Man, I don't, I don't remember that much, really. I don't know. Oh, you broke your hand in that fight, I guess. Yeah, but it, it didn't play a lot. Yeah, it's... This one. No, this one, this one. Um, it didn't actually, it was pretty funny. I'm like, hey, I broke my hand. And Mike Powell's like, can you still use it? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, well, use it. Okay. It, 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 it like hurt the grip, and that was it. But, um... So do you know how antibiotics work? Because I fucking didn't. So I was really sick, and I like sick, like a fluish type deal or something. So I started doubling up antibiotics. Okay. <laughs> Turns out you can't do that. I just got sicker, and you have no cardio when you. I was just like, don't double up your antibiotics, thinking you'll heal faster. They could replace as well. <laughs> I mean, could you be that fucking stupid? I was like 28, 29 years old. And I'll be like, man, I'm not getting, I'm not getting better fast enough. I gotta double up these antibiotics. It doesn't work like that. And uh, what led to your uh, retirement? From a knee injury. It was just affecting you too much. Well, I mean, I already, you know, haven't had a shoulder since 2007, so no shoulder, no knee. You know. Were you surprised? I mean, I'm sure you weren't that surprised that they ended up inducting you into the UFC Hall of Fame because you had a pretty impressive career and that, that one fight really put UFC on the map. No, I mean, I was, I was happy, you know. I'll take it. I'm getting more and more people in there, so I'm not like the weakest member in there, so. And you mentioned your daughter uh, a couple times. Is there any chance that she can go into MMA in the future? So I had her doing jits, and she was just, she she was all right. She would do it, you know. But she would like be doing girls' hair, like in the middle of. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. Like in the middle of a session, she was, and she didn't like the gi. It made her hot. And so then she did, she does ballet, gymnastics, a little soccer. She's just not in her man. She's a straight lover. She's just all like I love pink, and I don't want to roll. I want to do hair. So yeah, no. Any plans to have any more kids? No, man. We we tried for a couple of years. Well, I'm 40 now, and my daughter's already six, so probably no. We're done. What did you think of uh, Bonner naming his son after you? Well, I mean, he kind of named it after an event more. So, and Griffin Bonner. Griffin's a cool name, right? So, and that's a you know, that's a, I I was I mean I thought it was really cool. And I've seen in another interview. I, the amount of coffee that you drink in a day. Yeah, I'm trying, to, like, I'm trying to cut back, man. I'm trying to cut back. Uh, apparently it's not amazing for you, but yeah. Yeah, because that's one thing I think you and I have in common, because when I saw that, I'm like, I'm not the only one that drinks yeah. two or three pots of coffee. So I I don't drink coffee after three o'clock, though. Okay. Because I try and go to bed at 11, so. But uh, yeah, I, I, I have like a pot of coffee at the house, and then I come here, and I got the double espressos going over there, two double espressos, and then I work out, and then I eat, and then I have another double espresso, and then I eat lunch like later, and then I have one more double espresso, and I try to cap it at that. Try to. And I'm guessing you, you're taking a glass, right? You're not putting anything. No, nothing. Just yeah. Uh, because technically, I don't see how that's that bad for you because it's speeding up your metabolism. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, adrenal fatigue, which I've gotten before. Like, you ever get there where, like, it just doesn't work anymore. You know, so it's, it's you know, it's adrenal fatigue. It's taxing on your cardiovascular system, your heart, especially as we get older. So I'm trying to cut back. But maybe I think the wine I drink every night kind of mellows the coffee out. That's my strategy. I, I just drink anything to have like as yellow teeth as possible. Like, you know, coffee all day, wine all night, brown teeth, tan my teeth. 
Do you uh, take like pre workouts too, or did you? No, no, no. I, I, a couple times, and I actually hated them. I took a fetter for a little bit, and I, you know, it's great if you're just gonna lift or something, but if you like take a fetter and try to roll or spar, I feel like I was gonna die. That yeah, can make you more tired. I mean. Dude, it's just like, you can't get your second wind, you know, so what the hell? But for running, it can be good. For running, I don't know, but for like lifting, like if you're just gonna lift like heavy, yeah. like heavy with like a minute break in between, then yeah, I mean that, that. But I think it's like pretty much illegal in the States now. Okay. Is it a banned substance? In the it is a banned substance. It's a banned substance on your side as well. What's uh, your thoughts on uh, CM Punk as a fighter and his upcoming fight against another Owen one fighter? Well, let me say, I got to do a couple things with CM Punk and I found him to be a great person. I really liked him. Um, think about it this way, man. You know, you get somewhere in your life where you've kind of accomplished and you've made a little money and you've built a name for yourself and you get to where you're like, I want to what's my real passion in life like so for me what would it be well fighting was my real passion so i don't know what my second <laughs> playing football and that's probably not an option um so but but you think about how cool that is that his passion was to fight me you know people are going to say bad things about me and you know uh, i'm going to get beat up a lot because i'm you know a 35 year old and i don't have this kind of training under me but Yeah, I mean, good, good on him for, you know, for doing it, right? What do you think his chances are now against uh, an opponent that's, I guess, already oh, horrible? He's not good at fighting. I think he'll get a win. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's fighting a certified credential media member, so. Oh, the guy that CM Punk is fighting? Yeah, it's the guy that, uh, right? It's the guy that uh, moved from looking for a fight beat, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so you think CM Punk has a good chance of winning? Oh, yeah. And yeah. what are your uh, thoughts on Brock Lesnar now? Apparently, he's uh, Dana says he's coming back and he might even get a title shot. You know, I was just looking at him. Um, he's done, I think, four fights over a million dollars, over a million buys. Yeah. Um, I mean, if he can still generate that kind of, you know, those kind of numbers, then he's gonna get to do what he wants to do. So I guess he would probably fight the winner of the next heavyweight title fight, possibly because his suspension would be over, in theory. Yeah. Well, you know, would he be in the testing pool long enough or, you know, what's the deal on that, so. Do you think he'd have a good chance of, or a chance at all of actually taking the heavyweight title again? It's hard to say, man. Yeah. When was he heavyweight champion? 2010. Yeah. He was on the video game in 2010. It's already eight years. He's 42, right? Yeah, he's somewhere around Yeah, there. over 40. Eight years is a long time when you're that old, yeah. right? Um, his wrestling was amazing. You talk about yourself, you know, wrestling. To, to have that, that's a great skill to learn, like, young in life. It's, it's, you know, it's fundamental. And he can beat most guys. I mean, Kane was a horrible matchup because of the speed, and Kane's a, just also a great wrestler, but a grinding wrestler and quicker wrestler. But, uh, you know, I think he, like, he doesn't match up horrible with Stipe, DC. If he can get Stipe on his back and shoot some shots, DC might be a little tougher just because of the wrestling, another Kane. But, you know. He has a size advantage on DC, I guess. A huge size strength. He, for a man his size, uh, he's his Brock's always got great cardio. And what do you think uh, about Mayweather possibly fighting MMA? I've been saying that him and Connor should fight MMA in the UFC and just have a gentleman's agreement that there'll be no takedowns and then just do full stand up and if somebody hits the ground. Just the other guy let him stand up. That's, uh, I don't think that would technically, I could get in trouble with the commission for saying that, but I don't think that would technically be illegal, 
right? Oh, just, just a deal between two. Friends. Yeah, it's just a gentleman's agreement, and then you'd be all hype. Like, is somebody gonna break? Like, you know, if if uh, kind of gets caught flush with something, does he <laughs> decide fuck this? Like when he started wrestling Max Holloway back in the day when he tore his knee, you know. We all start wrestling when we get desperate, hurt, or tired, you know. Yeah. So it's great to wrestle. And uh, what's your opinion on uh, Connor's I guess publicity stunt gone wrong a few weeks ago? Oh, I don't think it was at all publicity stunt gone wrong. Mm-hmm. I guarantee it wasn't actually. No, I mean you know, I get it. Somebody's threatening his boy, he's trying to stick up for his boy, and you know I think. Just too far, man, you know? Like, it was cool. You come, hey, come on, come off the bus. But they're not coming. You can't just start throwing furniture, you know? You know? No, there's a fight the next day. No, there's people on the bus. That's crazy, man. It's, it's, you're not thinking it through, man, you know? Definitely not a publicity stunt, though. Is it. Uh has it been worked out, I guess, yet? Does it look like it's going to be settled with him and Dana? Oh, I, I don't know that. Nor, nor, you know, it's again, we're talking about athlete information. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't want to know. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I, I, when I go to the exec building, I tell them, I don't, I'm, I'm not a good secret keeper, so let's just not tell me. <laughs> now, what's your thoughts on Chuck Norris? No. No, I mean, it's just, it's like a funny thing, right? Yeah. Chuck Norris. Just, you know. I like Chuck Norris growing up. I didn't really like karate, but I mean, I don't know. I always thought it was funny. Yeah, the Walker Texas Ranger was a pretty good show. Yeah, right? So as a, as a tra- guy that gives training advice a lot, uh, what would be your best uh, general training advice to an upcoming? Walker Texas Ranger was like Murder, She Wrote, but for middle-aged men. <laughs> Boom. It really was. You watch like the, the, the where every episode starts and the yeah. The best part was the song, I think. Oh yeah. Something about eagles. They talk about eagles in the song. Pretty amazing. Wasn't he involved a little bit at UFC at one point, or like involved in like the promotion of MMA? I think he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he had that kickboxing late. Remember that? Yes. Which was a decent concept. I Dude. Think. It, it's funny, other than the stupid where they have the kind of concave thing. Yeah. That was kind of dumb. That's what Steve, uh, what's his name, blew his knee out on. Wonderboy Thompson. Oh, okay. Because of that. Yeah, you're right. Hall fought in that. He fought in that. Uh, a lot of people fought in that. Like the general, some general training advice for like a guy watching this that might want to be in the UFC. What's something you could tell them? That wants to be in the UFC. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's more specific training advice, right? You want to break down strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, just always be working towards something, improving some aspect of your game. Uh, you know, drilling, uh, which I never really did, but drilling, muscle memory, attempting to learn things. I got a book on, on how you learn things physically. I haven't started it yet, so can't I can't tell you, but just the drilling is important, you know? And then you can only go live so many times, but there's got to be a balance. And just to, just to monitor your energy levels. And that doesn't mean don't go, it just means, you know, have a smart practice. What's like a healthy amount to spar if, if you're not in a fight camp? So, yeah, it's, it's, I base that a lot on who you're going with, what's your level of competition, and what, how hard are we sparring, right? So if we're just drilling, if we're doing, you know, if we're working, you can do that three times a week. But if you're sparring, I wouldn't do more than six rounds a week, unless you have a title fight coming up. That's what, we would do seven, eight rounds, 10 rounds sometimes at extreme couture sparring. Why, why would we do that? There are no 10, there are no 50 minute fights. We would do that because it was kind of fun and it would kill the whole practice and then I wouldn't have to drill or work technique or work on footwork. We just fight for an hour and I was like, all right, we'll go home now. Yeah, that's not the best way to get good at something. You know, the other thing is that like when you're gonna spar, realize that this is the time when you're at your most 
vulnerable to injury, you have the most potential of injury, but that's also the time that when you're going full speed, you can learn the most. So try to record your sparring, watch it back the next day, and then you and your coach or you and your training partners just do a whole session based on what you did well and what you did wrong. You know, I gotta move better this way, I gotta. So to, to truly evolve your game, you have to do that. And that's actually one of the things I help guys here with do is, hey, you know, How'd your sparring go? What did you see? What did you do well? What, what, what didn't you do well? Here's some drills to fix that. And for lifting for, for an MMA fighter, I'm guessing it shouldn't be more bodybuilding type workout. Should it be like more kettlebells, like powerlifting type stuff? Or? So what I've learned in the past year we've been open is that I really don't know shit. So, um, I would ask my strength coach. I'd ask both David Baller. I'd ask, I'd ask the guy in the room writing programs for people all day, you know? I myself, you know, athletic movements, I can tell you that. Like just, you know, that, that, that heavy lift has, that heavy grind has a place, but, but the most important thing in a lifting program is periodizing for a goal, right? So, you know, making sure that you're, you're strong, you know, you're, you're, you're making gains in, in something as opposed to just moving heavy weight. I, I just like to get sweaty and not get worse. That's what I want to get sweaty, get some endorphins pumping, and not hurt myself or be worse than I was last week. That's my total. I, I don't work out hard though. I don't work out to improve. And when you hit pads, uh, how do you wrap your hands? I like, don't wrap my hands. You know? Nah, no, we're 16s and I don't hit hard enough to worry about it. You work more your speed? No, I mean, there's not that much speed either. I just don't have enough power to worry about. I'll do rounds of, of power like on a blue shield or on a softer bag. Um, for me, my hands are fine. My shoulders give out before my hands. If I actually land a hard punch, I feel it in my shoulder. Okay. Yeah, so. And for... Uh Jiu-Jitsu training, if you're going to be an MMA fighter, do you still recommend that they train in the gi? Oh yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you can definitely, I mean, I wouldn't do it the eight weeks leading up to a fight, but the second that fight's over, yeah, go get in the gi. Think about it almost as a different sport, you know? Just because it's harder? I mean, you know, Verdun, Machida, all those guys that do it, it, it can't be wrong. I mean, it can be wrong, but it's yeah. not. And for your acting, uh, just to touch on that briefly, you've, you've done, I think, CSI or something? Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. How was that experience for you? Oh, it, was, it was fine, you know. I, I had intended to do more of that. Um, you know, it was fun, right? It's easy. Um, it's only stressful if you care. It's only stressful if you let it be stressful. Yeah. Uh, it does frustrate you yeah, when you have a bad audition or a bad performance, so it pisses you off. You know, it's fun. Um, but I work too much here. You know, there's no. The thing about auditions is it doesn't work unless you've got time and open schedule to do it. You know, because you can't go out and try and book parts and do anything if you're working all day every day. Besides, there's there's enough old pale people in movies as it is. So fuck it. What's one more old pale has been? They're, they got that covered. It's just easy. it's like it's like with uh, commentating or being on Fox. It's like man, there's enough like washed up jocks on that. You know, I don't need to contribute to that. <laughs> you know, I got my own like very cool gig. I'll, I'll leave that for others to do it better. And finally, is there any uh, message you want to say to your fans to close this off that are that are going to watch this? Series? Yeah, it's just like, wow, you haven't moved on. I've already moved on. I'm already over me. No, it's, it, you know, just, just thank you, man. I appreciate it. Um, that's really it, you know. I, I, uh, I mean, I hope that, that whatever mild inspiration they drew from me, I, I hope that, that you know, that, that, that it did inspire them to do something or help them in that situation. But it's just fighting. It's kind of fun, easy money. Is burning a lighter on yourself a good way to build toughness practice? I feel like it is, especially when you're 16. Yeah. Is 16 still your record? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, 
to, that's a really hard. Like there's a set of panic that starts going through your body after about six seconds that like, I'm hurting myself. Yeah, that's, that's respectable in a lot of ways. Yeah, in, in uh, you know, stupidity. Don't, don't watch Taxi Driver. Uh, my self poisons. And do you have any social media where people can follow what you're doing? Yeah, I have all that stuff. The huge, you know. It's just Forrest Griffin, Twitter, Snapchat. Well, Snapchat is uh, Big Hairy Balls, I think. One. No. Uh, you know. What, what am I? Instagram, Snapchat, Cameo, that's a thing. Uh, Facebook, that's a thing. Um, you know, I'm just collecting random data on Facebook and selling to the Russians, but don't worry about that. And the last question is, what do you see for the future of MMA as a sport? <clears throat> I mean, I think international growth would be the next step. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, I think people thought it, it had an unlimited growth potential because it grew so quick, but... Uh, and we, we can still grow more in the States, there's definitely we can get more people into it, for sure. We need to grow, we need to continue to, uh, to, to reach out to young people and to make them lifelong fans and to provide them with that positive experience. But um, at the end of the day, it's fighting, and it's not for everyone. Well, very good. Thanks a lot for uh, speaking to us. It's been a real honor and pleasure. Well, thank you, yeah. Well, I mean, mostly thanks to mine. so. Hey, what's up? I'm Forrest Griffin, UFC Hall of Famer, and more importantly, for the purpose of this tour that I'm about to give you, VP of Athlete Development for the Performance Institute. That would be the Performance Institute. I'm gonna give you guys a quick look around, and uh, we'll see what's to be seen. So what's this station? This is just where fighters can yeah, have some fuel in the pre, uh, pre and post workout. Uh, good piece of design here. I think it's built off the locker room, so you don't, uh, You don't have to, you don't have an excuse not to get your, you know, nutrition or like different snacks and stuff. I guess someone's in charge of keeping that stock. Oh yeah. I, I'm an amateur nutritionist and stuff. Uh, sort of side app for all your whereabouts. Cryotherapy, low level laser light therapy, not a tanning bed. What does that do, the low level? Uh, it reduces whole body inflammation. I was doing it for a while and I started sleeping better, so I quit. <laughs> and how do you find the cryotherapy compared to ice baths? Uh, you know, I think I'm preferential to ice baths. The research will tell you that's a little better for your nervous system. I only did cryotherapy a couple of times and it didn't feel like it was worth the 45 bucks. So, yeah, I felt like the, the 12 bucks for ice was a better deal. I tell you what though, it sucks less because it's three and a half minutes, whereas this is, you know, eight to 10, three and three. We do a lot of the contrast baths. Oh, this is the ice bath in here. Yeah, it's 50 degrees, 105. Steam, sauna, hydroworks, treadmill. Uh, so that's for running in the water? Yeah, and then, you know, resistance running. It's pretty awesome, actually. So players will come here and cut weight and use the saunas? Yeah. As hard as they can. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, I think a lot of athletes get in habit of Sign after a workout. Just, I always like to turn over as much water in my body as I could. Yeah, if that makes sense, just to take down the water in and move through. Does that help your recovery? Did you find oh, recovery? No, no. Maybe I mean, just with all the supplements you're taking. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's probably just good for your liver and stomach. Uh, so physical therapy, we do cupping, rehabbing, uh, cupping, intramuscular assisted soft tissue, dry needling, 
uh, as well as Plotus. You see the slam balls here? No pounds. How many physiotherapists do you have working here? Two. Two, yeah. Reinforced impact wall. Those hanger doors at the bottom open. You can do sprints, plyos, sleds, you know. We, we have a uh, strength staff of four permanent, and, or three permanent and one intern right now. So, it's pretty awesome. And this is all the weight and cardio stuff. Yeah, we'll peek in here for stuff. So we have private rooms in the back. I don't know if you've ever seen a Biodex. No, I haven't. So you can do an exercise and it basically tells you, you know, percentages left, right. Oh, that's pretty cool. So if you have an injured arm or something, like you can Yeah, you can tell, you know. So that's a dual energy x-ray, the gold standard body composition, does your bone density as well. So it's very precise. Uh, yeah. Find out where the fighters are at injury wise. So. I blew my left knee out a couple times. I have 2.1 pounds less muscle in my left leg than my right. And on that thing, I was my my left hamstring. My quads were actually pretty similar, but my left hamstring was 39% uh, good than my right. Hamstring in my left leg always hurts. And you know, for like a week I did like corrective movement stuff and a lot of balance and proprioceptive stuff. And it was hard, so I quit. I might have made it two weeks. I seem to have about a two week lifespan of everything. You know, I'm yeah, you like, get eh, it's boring. It's dark. So these are weights. So I'm guessing you know how weights work. Yeah. You got what, four or five squat racks? Yeah, but just before, so we are not a D1 football team. And you notice, you see this a lot in new facilities, space. So this isn't, you know, offensive lineman, defensive lineman type training. This is, you know, your body in space. And then all these hanging doors open, you got your turf area to do, you know, metabolic conditioning circuits or whatever fun folk construction shit you're into. But the cool piece here is, uh, the bilateral force, force plates and the elite form cameras. So it tells you how much weight you're moving, how fast. So, you know, the bars, the speed of movement can be as important as like the absolute, like, you know, how much weight you're moving. And then force plates. So it's all you jump, uh, counter movement, strength, you know. So they're actually measuring when you push off into the floor and that load and explosion gives you a rate of force development, power profile, all these things, this is what we use to, or this is what the strength team uses to write the programs, you know, where are you deficient, where are you strong, uh, you know. Are you still able to work out here like on I, I, I do, uh, I, I do, I work out usually most mornings in here for about an hour. 90 minutes all in, but you know, moving, just waking up. So yeah, that's it though. I try not to work out too much. I My new strategy is to work out now at 40, like I want to be working out when I'm still 60. Yeah. You know, so like I said, I just did the high yoga this morning, high Pilates actually. I'm, I'm uh, last time I, I did the uh, trap bar deadlift, not regular deadlift, but trap bar. My back hurt for two days and I said, man, fuck. You know, so I, I'm gonna start, I guess, not going too much heavier than my body weight on uh, squats and trap bar deadlifts. And I only lift like twice a week. You do mostly like cardio, I guess, and stretching? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll do like lighter, you know, movement stuff, uh, proprioceptive drills, you know, quickness type stuff, track workouts. Do you I, still do any like uh, fight conditioning just to I, I hit mitts and I do bag work, it's, it's fun. Uh, this is a lab. This is where Dr. Dre went with his pen and his pad. No, uh, so it's a hypoxic chamber, you know, hypoxic chamber sim simulates uh, high altitude, low oxygen. Ultra G treadmill uh, over there, that guy. So bubble wrap treadmill type deal. 
uh, heart monitors, VO2 max, blood lactate threshold analysis, science. So every fighter that comes in here to train is going to get tested on all of this? Well, if you, yeah, if you have this equipment, why not build a profile of your strengths and weaknesses to design a plan moving forward, you know? Uh, if you think about like any sort of skills combine, this is, this is a physical prep combine. Like, where are you at physically? You know, what's your injury history? What's your training history? Um, so it's, you know, otherwise you're kind of just getting a cookie cutter plan. And the thing about our sport, or the thing about MMA as opposed to other sports, if you think about, you played football, basketball, any of those? Amateur wrestling pretty much, and rugby. Okay, so no. All right. Um, they know exactly, even, even in wrestling, you know exactly what physical attributes you want to highlight, right? So all defensive ends trained to all short stops need the same skill set. Every fighter is different, so every fighter has to kind of build their own profile. That makes sense. Who are some of the best pound for pound athletes that uh, have come through here? So that, that's another thing. We, uh, well, that, that, that first wing over there is all HIPAA compliant, but I don't know. I don't know of any idea. I mean, that's all. So we do, we've collected over, you know, 31,000 data points, over 350 profiles from athletes, and they're all anonymized and normalized. So I've never been able to tell you who's the best athlete, who's not. I mean, I can right. guess, but I would be guessing. I don't know their, their numbers. What I want to know more importantly is what's the bell curve of the 205 pound male strength? You know, what's, what's the counter movement jump looking like what's their reactive index type type numbers you know so so you can kind of gauge yourself against the other people that you potentially fight so okay. which you know otherwise you think about hey you know this guy's you're you're scared to get tested because you're gonna have a bad day right yeah has Brock Lesnar been in here yet for the testing or? no 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 I'd imagine he'd be pretty fucking strong though. what about uh, CM Punk no no, no. Definitely, definitely. Here we go. I'm going to grab my water. Oh, Use the snacks here. I'm going to put all, I'll put away. This is a very cool uh, VP of operations. Where contenders become champions and champions become legends. So. It's pretty cool, a lot of the branding and stuff, uh, the, the people that actually in the facility came up with. So this is the Hall of Fame wall, this is? Mm-hmm. It is. What do you think about uh, Art Davey being named for the Hall of Fame this week? I think it's pretty awesome, man. He was in here, I got to talk to him, he was a really cool cat. I liked him, I thanked him. Who's your uh, favorite Hall of Famer? Um, probably Big Knock. Yeah. And, I mean, just, I mean, Randy Couture, you know, Chuck Liddell, I actually had personal close relationships with, and Randy helped me quite a bit throughout my career. But, uh, Big Knock was the kind of guy, the first guy I was like, man, that's, you know, I wanted to pattern myself after him. Yeah. What about Dan Severin? Oh yeah, so I just I just talked to him. Um, he was we just had him in here uh, doing some stuff not too long ago, so that was cool. I got that's my goal to get a picture of everybody next to their Hall of Fame picture. <laughs> yeah, I got to wrestle him once, and I asked him about his uh, match with you, but oh. I guess it was like one of your first matches. Oh yeah, he had fond like, memories. Though. Yeah, he's so I met him. I met him in 2005 at an expo, and he had no idea we'd ever fought. No idea. Well, you were pretty skinny at that point, too, I guess. Dude, I, I was, yeah, I was working, uh, well, I was still like 230, but I was working, uh, I was actually thinner then than when I was trying to make light heavyweight, yeah. I was working uh, full-time nights as a cop, and you just don't eat much, you know? Yeah. You just like, and uh, it's funny, you know, I was like, fuck, I'm going to heavyweight. And then I got skinnier. And that's what happens. I got light heavyweight and I start gaining weight. I was like, the mind is a terrible thing. Yeah. Um, power cubes, force output measurement. Somebody's been using it. This isn't, that's funny. I was, 
I guess I wasn't here, I was here Friday, so this room's like different. When I left it, people working out how to do that. So obviously an octagon, Vicon cameras, which are the motion capture, you know, the fancy dancing cameras. Uh, and then we have regular uh, cameras so you can watch your playback right there. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to send it on thumb drives. But those files are huge because there's three high def cameras that we have to send. So. And who are those sent to? The people that review everything? Or? No, I mean they're, the they're sent to whoever, what, whatever fighter wants to record and do them, and then everything's destroyed. And that's that's my job. I take it seriously. Again, so well, you know, I want to get a a guy or gal to come in and feel totally comfortable, you know, sharing their injury history or whatever, and knowing that that's not going anywhere. Because I, I mean, you know, as a you know, former fighter myself, I would be like, nah. You know, the second I hear that our oh, information's getting out, no way. Yeah. But so I, I don't know any of that. That's the easiest way. You know, it's like I don't need to know that. Well, then our physical therapists and nutritionists are actually uh, hip com uh, bound by HIPAA. But weight is not medically sensitive information. But anything that has to be like diagnosed or tested, uh, that is medically sensitive information. There's the uh, outdoor sprint track, which I used for some reason the other day, and my hamstring still hurt. I was doing, uh, I was running in sub five, 30s, 30 yard dash. You don't know about the 30 yard dash, it's really gonna be the, the new mark. So beautiful campus. I guess there's no dorms here yet? No, there's not gonna be. No. No, that's, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, you see, just, we, 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 we thought about that sort of thing, and it's just become really tough, you know? I, I also want people to have to, you know, have a little skin in the game, go through a hotel, whatever. Because like I said, once you step on campus, breakfast, lunch, dinner, Pre post workouts, you know, everything's free. Sublobby, you do point that out. And you just bring a couple of mouthfuls too. This is all the CrossFit type stuff, I guess. Uh, yeah. Pre activation, you know. Ninja Warrior. I prefer Ninja Warrior stuff. I was thinking about uh, maybe getting like a kettlebell thing here, just because I personally like them. What's the best kettlebell exercise for uh, for an MMA fighter? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I do not know. Maybe, maybe some variation of a clean. Okay. You know, a heavy, you know, catch type Olympic, almost like an Olympic, a bastardized Olympic movement. But that's what I do with them because I don't, I never do Olympic movements. Why is that? Just harder on the body? No, no, I mean, if you do them right, I don't think they're that high in the body. I just never did them. Okay. And then when you've been lifting your whole life, and you suck at something, you don't want to start it. So, auditorium over here. That's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Nothing, man. How you doing? I'm just doing the tour. What else would I be doing? <laughs> what else would I be doing? Yeah, working. So that's our head of performance. This is where no magic has literally ever happened. emails on Sunday. Relentless. Yeah, you can tell I, I'm going to try to like make this part like of the uh, room like almost a little bit nice. Just so when you're walking past it doesn't look so lonely. I made one of the commercials for Far Cry 5. Did you really? Yeah, the, the prank commercial. I haven't seen, I haven't seen it. Yet. That's cool. It's on the YouTube site. Yeah, they 
like played out a scene to like unsuspecting people that came into this bar. You're a video game player, I guess? No, not at all. You just like the skull? I was just like, they were like, hey, does anybody want this? And I was like, yeah. And then I broke it. <laughs> so, I was not trash. What do you, what do you guys want to do this interview? How about right here? Yeah, that'd be good. What is this office anyway? It's just like a... No, it's like just a, a lounge. Lounge, yeah. You know. Maybe we had a couple of the athlete lounges, but just a place to hang out in between stuff. So that was the UFC Performance Institute, and now that you've had the tour, you're ready for professional fighting.